uh, political parties and the uh, Freedom Party of Ontario is a duly registered uh, party so we are very pleased to uh, hear you sir. Senator Baudouin, Mr. Edwards, and members of the Special Joint Committee. Please allow me to thank everyone responsible for having this opportunity to present Freedom Party of Ontario's official position on the process for amending the Canadian Constitution. Our Constitution has many shortcomings, of which the present amending formula is only one. A Constitution specifies the authority the citizens of a country delegate to their government to exercise on their behalf and the structure under which this will operate. It therefore follows that a constitution must be based on a clear and consistent philosophy of government if it is not to be oppressive. A philosophy of government states why men need the institution of government and what its function ought to be. A constitution without a proper philosophy of government is like a car without gas. It won't get us anywhere. Government exists to protect the natural rights of all individuals to life, liberty, and property, and not for any other purpose. Unless our Constitution is so designed to protect individual rights <coughs> as opposed to so-called collective rights, no amount of amendments, referendums, or any other democratic method can ever avoid the gross injustice that will inevitably result. The people of Canada will never be assured that their freedom and inalienable rights will be protected unless the most overriding feature of our Constitution is a guarantee of individual rights, including private property rights. The smallest minority in the world is the individual. Whenever individual rights are not protected, you have a recipe for the oppression of minorities. As things stand now, our constitutional guarantee of rights and freedoms is meaningless, and our fundamental freedoms are not fundamental. Both are victims of the notwithstanding clause and the so-called reasonable limits that have been used to prevent oppressive laws from being thrown out in our courts. Quebec's language laws and Ontario Sunday closing laws are just two examples of this. You are all familiar with the amending formula set out in Part 5 of the Constitution Act of 1982. This formula is horrendously complex, allows provinces to opt out of amendments they don't like, gives the 11 first ministers undue power to push amendments through without due consideration of their merits and does not recognize the fundamental equality of the several provinces. An amending formula that produces backroom deals that cannot withstand the light of day must be scrapped, and the sooner the better. The ideal amending formula would be open and easy to understand, and it would effectively limit the power of politicians to control our constitutional destiny. Such a formula can be devised by combining features of the formulas found in the United States Constitution and the Australian Constitution. Like Canada, these are large federal states with a history of strong inter-regional rivalries and tensions. Australia also has the parliamentary system of government, like Canada. The United States Constitution provides that amendments must first be passed by two-thirds of both houses of the Federal Congress. Following this, a seven-year period is provided during which the amendment must be approved by at least three-quarters of the states. The Australian Constitution provides that amendments must first be approved by both houses of its Federal Parliament. Following this, they are submitted directly to the Australian people in a national referendum. The amendments must be approved by a majority of those voting and a majority in a majority of the states to be ratified. 
Canada should adopt a combination of the features of these two amending formulas for future amendments. Recognizing the power the parliamentary system gives to first ministers, he would adopt the requirements of two-thirds of each House of Parliament from the United States Constitution. And also the requirement to that three-quarters of the provinces approve it. For the same reason, we would adopt the referendum procedure used in Australia to give the people of Canada the final verdict on constitutional change. <coughs> if, a if a referendum process is adopted, safeguards must be in place to ensure that amendments enjoy the support of the great majority of Canadian citizens. It must not be possible for a minority or even a bare majority to impose them upon the entire country. If between 75 and 80 percent of eligible voters cast ballots, a figure quite typical for federal elections, it is quite possible for a minority of adult Canadians to be a majority of those voting. For this reason, the criteria for ratification should be based on the number of citizens eligible to cast ballots. This would place the advocates of any future constitutional change under the onus of demonstrating to all Canadians why any proposed amendment should be adopted. We propose that the support of three quarters of Canadian citizens of voting age be required, along with a majority of Canadians of voting age in three quarters of the provinces. A draft amendment to implement this formula is contained in my submission. Thank you all very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Frampton. Uh, I now turn to the government side, uh, Mr. Uh, Ross Reed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, welcome to the committee. And I congratulate you on putting together this paper and coming and presenting it to us. Uh, it's interesting. I don't, um, our first witness this afternoon was John White. And he talked about his political philosophy, which was based on preventing the oppression of the state and the individual. I suspect, however, you might come from a different political perspective towards that, but it's an interesting, it's an interesting position. And I personally agree very strongly about the rights of the individual and the importance that we protect the individual against the state and in, and in some cases collective rights. And I, you, within the work that we do, the problem of collective rights enters into it. Two questions on that, though. If in a referendum, and particularly as you talk about a minority or a bare majority uh, should not be able to, uh, a minority or bare majority, to impose them upon the entire country, how, with a referendum, do you protect the rights of the minority, which, as you say, sometimes often is, is an individual, against that great majority, particularly when it pertains to rights? Well, as you will notice in our submission, we propose that in order for any future change to take effect, that it be required that it receive the affirmative support of three quarters, in other words, 75% of all adult Canadians. That's extremely difficult. We also propose that it gain an overall majority within three quarters of the province, or 10 provinces, that would require eight provinces to vote in favor. That is an extremely difficult criterion to meet. Therefore, it would be, in our opinion, very unlikely that that large a number of people would vote in favor of a measure that would in some way limit the rights of individuals. In addition, our proposal is that the figure of three quarters be arrived at by determining the total number eligible to vote. So if people stay home, that's, that's exactly the same as if they go and vote against it. But all right, let's say we want to put the rights to private property in the Constitution. You're, you're hoisting yourself on your own petard, you know? Well, I would, I recognize that it would be quite difficult to get such an amendment adopted with our proposed method, given the current cultural climate. However, 
it would be equally difficult to get a large number of provincial legislatures to vote in favor of that given their current makeup and also in view of the current climate. And I would much rather see changes that we would like to see put in the Constitution submitted through an open process whereby everyone understands how it works, what's required for approval, uh, what is sufficient to defeat a, a, an amendment, rather than the process we have now where even the experts don't understand it. Last June, prior to the uh, expiry date of the Meech Lake Accord, even the experts <coughs> could not agree on whether or not that June 23rd was in fact a hard deadline. So if even the experts can't agree on how to interpret the existing formula, I can't see how you can expect Canadians to understand it or to have a respect for it. June 23rd is a, was a hard day, as we'd say, in Newfoundland, especially that day in Newfoundland. It was, uh, it was quite something. Last question, how do you reconcile the rights of the individual against your view that the provinces should be equal? In particular, your reference in your original paper, and I, I mean, I can't, I don't want to go back through it to find out the specific reference, but, uh, you know, you, you talk about uh, the, uh, because of the population criteria, some provinces have more power than others. The argument being, why should the 560,000 people in Newfoundland uh, have sway over the 9 or 10 million people in Ontario? I mean, you get into that sort of a conflict. I haven't resolved that in my own mind, but I'd be interested in your reconciliation of those two positions. Well, in, in fact, there is no contradiction between advocating individual rights and also the equality of provinces, because the two really are separate. On the one hand, we look at the individual's right not to be oppressed by other people in society, in particular, and in particular by the state. On the other hand, we look at the relationship between entities within a federal state, in this case provinces, and it is axiomatic in a federal state, a genuine federal state, all the states or provinces, depending on the country you're speaking about, are in effect partners, and they are equal partners, they have to be equal partners. There can never be any distinct powers or special status for one province or state that are not also accorded to all the others. Whenever you have that, you no longer have a federal state in the strict meaning of the term. Okay, but are you prepared to go backwards and apply that to individuals? Absolutely. Everyone should be equal under the law. Everyone should have equal rights. There should be no special status in law for certain individuals as opposed to others. Or discrimination, discrimination against people in law, where you know, private relations between private individuals are another matter altogether. That's up to each individual's discretion. However, the law must treat all individuals equally, with no distinction based on any factors such as race, religion, ethnicity, or anything of that nature. Would you make any special provision for aboriginals in the Canadian Constitution? None whatsoever. There should be no distinction between individuals under the law. There should be no special status for any individual as opposed to any other individual. Uh, we haven't got time to go on where I'd like to go. Yeah, Mr. Just, Blackburn, uh, I, I knew you'd cut me off. <laughs> um, we all don't get treated equally around here either. <laughs> I, I was just uh, going to interject there is still section 9124 for uh, Amerindians. To, that is right in the core of the Constitution. But anyway, that's... Uh, eh? There is a reason for that, of course. But I believe he disagrees with that uh, distinction being made. I think that was the point he was making. Oh, I see. Okay. Monsieur Blackburn? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Frampton, I find your brief very interesting. 
especially since you take the time to raise the difficulties for experts to interpret the Canadian Constitution, especially when it comes to amending that Constitution. And indeed, there are many clauses and provisions that come up. Some uh, come to mind, rather. Some uh, amendments would require the uh, consent of seven provinces out of ten or unanimity. Do you think it right to enshrine in the Constitution a uh, referendum model in the Constitution? Or should there be a more flexible possibility, i.e. to change the amending formula with the agreement of uh, seven out of ten provinces or two-thirds, representing uh, 50% of the population? Should there be a veto for Quebec, given that it's a distinct society? if uh, very basic aspects uh, for Quebec will be changed. Do you think that the referendum model should only be used when we're really in an impasse as a way of breaking that impasse? For example, if we wanted to change the amending formula to replace it with a simpler one, i.e. Uh, 7 out of uh, 10 provinces with a veto, what if the uh, premiers don't agree? Well, then perhaps then the federal government could use a referendum as an ultimate means for asking the public to decide. And then the premiers would be bound by the results of the referendum because the public would have spoken. So do you think that the referendum should only be used as an ultimate measure? And do you think that it shouldn't be enshrined in the Constitution? I'm wondering about this because I think that it, if it were enshrined, it would become a far more complex and uh, long procedure. You've raised a very interesting question regarding uh, the present amending formula versus a formula using referendums. And in general, I would say that no, we should not use the referendum procedure only as a last resort. We should use it for all amendments. Apart, uh, you also raised the question of Quebec vis-à-vis uh, -vis other provinces, how the method that we propose with a slight variation is also used in Switzerland, in which there are not two language groups, but four language groups. And Switzerland has uh, for many centuries been the, one of the most stable and peaceful societies in the world. We would not in, be in favor of any sort of veto power for any one province versus the other. As I mentioned earlier, in a federal state, all states or provinces or whatever the divisions of a country are called are each other's partners. Therefore, they must be considered fundamentally equals. They must be given equal power, equal presence, if you will, on the national scene, and ideally equal representation in one of the two federal legislative bodies. Re with regard to the distinctiveness of the province of Quebec in particular, Certainly, I recognize that uh, Quebec is in many ways distinct. It has many differences, uh, many unique advantages that are not found elsewhere in the country. However, that does not mean to imply that other parts of Canada are not in their own way also unique. Recently, I've had occasion to travel to many different parts of the country in, on my business. and. I assure you that when I was in Nova Scotia, I did not make the mistake of thinking I was in New Brunswick. When I was in Saskatchewan, I did not make the mistake of thinking I was in Alberta or Manitoba. I knew in each case exactly where I was and that it had a different flavor than neighboring provinces would have. I really don't see how you can sell that sort of thing to Quebec if you don't give it some kind of protection 
Some elements in the Constitution can be changed uh, with the uh, present uh, amending formula of two-thirds of the provinces, but that would uh, mean very grave consequences for Quebec with respect to perhaps the Senate. And if Quebec doesn't have protection, then it is threatened. Threatened in the short term, mid-term or long term. And the referendum where you would go for three quarters of the population, well, if there was a, a proposal made, then perhaps Quebec would be swallowed up by the majority of uh, Canadians, swallowed up by a decision that Quebec disapproved of. And so I really feel that there's a flaw in your formula. And that's really our work. We have to find a way of breaking the stalemate. We want to bring Quebec in and have it on board. But Quebec wants protection. If it's going to have renewed federalism, then perhaps the amending formula will have to be changed. In your question, you've spoken of the perceived necessity to sell whatever is, evolves from these hearings in Quebec in particular, as opposed to in other parts of the country. You've also raised the question of protection for Quebec, as though somehow Quebec was threatened within the Canadian Federation. Getting back to the original context of our presentation, namely that the protection of individual rights is paramount. If we had a constitution where individual rights were protected across the board, there would be no discussion of legal privileges or special status for Quebec in this case. It would be cut and dried that the types of oppressive legislation which do exist in that province and which appear to enjoy wide popular support in that province could not be implemented. They would be invalid. They would be blocked by the courts as they ought to be. I've, I fail to see, though, in what way Quebec needs protection. Protection from what? In what way does our federal structure threaten Quebec? Do I have time to answer, Mr. Chairman? Given the importance of the matter, I think uh, I'll give you two or three minutes to respond. When you talk about threats against Canada and whether it's threatened, well, with the present uh, amending formula, where the Senate can be reformed with the agreement of seven out of ten provinces, well, at present, Quebec, there are four main regions, and Quebec has 24 senators for its region. If you take the model suggested by uh, Western Canada, the Triple E Senate, then Quebec would lose out. It would lose out on a major account. Most, Canada's, most Canadians might decide to change the makeup of the Supreme Court through referendum if Quebec uh, was against this and it would be swallowed up again by a majority of Canadians, English-speaking Canadians, who might decide against Quebec and they would have their decision go through because they're a majority. In 1867, when Canada was formed, there was Upper and Lower Canada, Ontario and Quebec, Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. Quebec has always been distinct. It's always spoken French. That's in the Constitution. And once again, that might be changed with your amending formula. Because if a referendum were held and three quarters of Canadians decided that, OK, it wouldn't be uh, uh, French and English, it would be English across Canada, that is why Quebec needs protection. It has to have it. If it doesn't have it, then we just can't continue. respond to that. You haven't made the case that there is 
a threat within the Canadian Federation to Quebec or in, to be more particular to the existence of the French language and culture. On the contrary, there are more than five million people in Quebec, a very large group of people within even the population of Canada whose mother tongue is French and who continue to speak that language fluently. Do you mean to suggest that if Quebec does not somehow have special status, special powers, that they will all stop speaking French? They will not teach it to their children? Je répète, si vous changez la formule... I'll repeat what I said. If you change the amending formula, and if you only need two-thirds of the provinces, and if Quebec doesn't have the protection it needs, then nothing is to prevent there being new amendments brought forward which will completely change the Constitution and will make Quebec lose out on some very important elements which are extremely important to it and for good cause. That's all I have to say, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Madame uh, Campbell, point of order? I, I, think it's, I think it's legitimately saying what you have said in your brief, and, and I don't think you answered that. What he's saying is that if there was a vote on, on uh, protecting the language in Quebec uh, and it went three quarters against protecting it, then you don't mm -hmm. feel there's any reason to protect the language of Quebec, even though they only have 25% of the population. That is correct. Okay. We, do not, we, we do not believe that there is any validity whatsoever in having laws that tell people, for example, what's, what language they may erect a sign in on their own private property. We do not believe there is any validity whatsoever in telling people what language their children will, must be educated in. That's for the parents to decide, not the state. The only thing I had here is that uh, one of the reasons why Confederation was done the way it was and one of the reasons why we had federalism instead of legislative union is because in the Maritimes, the people wanted the federation, and in Quebec, because of the civil code and the French language, they wanted the federal state instead of a union, mm -hmm. legislative union. Nobody knows the future. One day, Canada may be 50 million, uh, may have a population of 50 million. It's, prob it's probable, in my opinion. And then if you have six or seven millions of um, Quebecers, by hypothesis, I don't know. Nobody knows. Um, there is not a, a watertight protection for the civil code and the French language in the sense that uh, the division of power may be amended by seven provinces with 50% of the population. Of course, you will say to me, because of Section 38, Quebec may opt out. But if there is no mandatory compensation, as it is the case, outside culture and education, then, of course, it's a very serious um, Amendment and the same uh, may be true of some others. So, to me, uh, there is a valid reason for such a protection, and it's an easy amendment in the case of the civil code it's to say that uh, if ever it is changed, Quebec will be protected, and uh, it's a richness for Canada. It's not an obstacle. But anyway, I mean. <laughs> Uh, we may have the right to agree or disagree on this. Uh, Madame Campbell? Since I brought up the point of order and he answered it, I think I speak for most of the members, uh, all the members, I'm sure, of the whole committee that would say that we recognize that distinctive uh, nature of Quebec. I, for my colleague over there, I just wanted to clarify his answer for the record, but certainly I think we all recognize uh, Quebec and the, and the uh, status it has within Canada. With, with respect, I did not ever say that Quebec was not distinctive. I merely pointed out that... It could lose it by just not giving it any veto. No, I, dis I disagree. The, the, the distinctiveness is not something that applies to the government of Quebec. It's something that's found in the people who live there. And what if Quebec has 
precisely the same powers and authorities as the other provinces, that's not going to change. Just because the, the government of Quebec doesn't have certain legislative powers that other provinces don't have, is not suddenly going to make the population of Quebec change overnight. No, but if you have a referendum, and I hate to disagree with you, but if you have a referendum in which three quarters is the majority needed, then you can visualize in the future, as has been brought out, that the uh, rights that belong to Quebec could be voted by the majority of three quarters to say that they, they no longer exist. That's all we're trying to well, point out. What you're speaking of, though, are not rights. They're privileges. You're, well, you're, you're speaking oh, about oh, uh, groups of people. They came into confederation as for, for, you know, sort of states coming into, provinces coming into, with sort of different rights that other provinces who have joined have had those rights protected too. And Newfoundland, New PI, others have been given protections in joining fe confederation. I think Quebec was given protections too. But, but, but if your with theory, with with your theory is well founded, it means that in a democratic society like Canada, we will never need any constitutional guarantees. No. But obviously, everybody in this country say that we need some constitutional guarantee. Yeah, the the uh, Aboriginal people, uh, the minorities. PEI. Uh, PEI. And uh, uh, is not federalism based on rights, not on privileges? Obviously, Absolutely. it's on rights. Absolutely, it is based on rights in particular, but the, what I'm hearing here is that there is concern about groups of people, yeah. as if groups of people somehow possess rights that the individuals within those groups do not possess. And in fact, there are only individual rights. There is no such thing as a collective right. There are no collective rights. All rights that people enjoy and have are things that they get from nature. They're natural rights. They're born with those rights. They don't gain any extra rights when they join a group or from being but How part can of a you group. explain section 93, denominational rights, which are collective rights? How can you explain 91, 24, section 25, 35, and 37 of the Act of 1982, which obviously the Supreme Court said <coughs> 10 times that they are collective rights. The collective rights are enshrined in the Constitution of Canada, at least at two levels. Aboriginal people, section 25 and 35 are very, very clear cut. It's not me who is saying that. It's the Supreme Court of Canada. And 93 has been declared by the Supreme Court of Canada and the Privy Council as enshrining collective rights. For the rest, it's debatable whether it's collective or individual. But for those two, no doubt, it is collective rights. Well, anyway, I mean... Uh, <laughs> the present constitution may well have provisions Do you want to amend the Canadian Constitution? which appear to yeah. grant collective rights. It is. If so, to the extent that such provisions are in the Constitution, then they should be amended. They should be repealed. You would repeal 91, 24, and 25, and 35? I would repeal any part of the Constitution that appears to give legal or other validity to the concept of collective rights as opposed to individual rights, yes. Your point is clear, Kat. Okay. Uh, Senator, yes. on first, Senator Gigante. On the first page of your brief, sir, in uh, the fourth paragraph, you say government exists to protect the natural rights of individuals to life, liberty, and property, and not for any other purpose. That is correct. Uh, in protecting the life of an individual, would you say the government should protect that life against disease? If you mean should the government set up a monopoly system of health insurance and compel individuals against their free will to buy their health insurance from that monopoly, then the answer is no. How they about the right. uh, protecting? You, you so the right isn't equal. The right to pro protection of your life isn't equal if you're poor and if you're rich, in um, your view. 
Well, the, the poor contrary, person sir, in a the... system which doesn't have state medical insurance uh, will not necessarily get protection for his life uh, as good protection as a rich person. So the, the rights you want to guarantee are not equal. That is not true. It's not. The not. rights are equal. The access may not be, but that is not anything that relates to the legal status of the individual. On the, rather, it is something that relates to their economic status, the type of work they do, the kind of income they may have, and also to the types of values and choices that they have and make as they go through their life. Would you make an exception for a person who, say, is mentally handicapped and cannot earn a sufficient living to uh, pay a doctor? In cases like that, I believe that such a person, how, however unfortunate such a person is, and I certainly agree that that is an unfortunate circumstance, it, that person, in my opinion, has no option but to rely on charitable organizations. There are only three ways in life in which to acquire something. You can earn it by your own efforts. You can be given it as a gift or through some charitable means, or you can take it by force from someone else. And nobody, for whatever reason they may have, has any right to take something from someone else by force. Would you say that somebody can uh, enjoy or even defend his liberty if his education is grossly unequal to that of another? Yes, I would say that. You would. So. Uh, an uneducated person that doesn't even know what his liberty is in terms of the law and so on, in your view, is as able to defend himself as some of the eminent lawyers around this table. Well, but by no means would he be absolutely equal in the ability to understand legal maxims as those lawyers necessarily. However, the fact that a person has not been educated in a particular academic environment by no means guarantees that he or she does not have other means to acquire that knowledge. Well, would for, that for example, hmm. a person may, have, may not have gone to university, yet may have, through self-study, learned about economics or other subjects that are normally taught at university. The fact he has not been to university does not necessarily mean he has not had the opportunity to study those subjects. Would a poor person in the system you see have a right to free legal aid? Again, I, I make the point that no one has any right to take something from another by force. The end does not justify the means. If the means are themselves evil, as in the use of force, to take something by force, is theft. If I come up to you and say, oh, I'm poor, um, I need legal assistance, you must help me, and you have no obligation, in effect, I am stealing your legal expertise. Well, and I have no right to do that. Supposing there is a single mother and, the, and she wants support payments for her children uh, from their father, and this requires some court action. Uh, you, you would not grant that single mother who may be uneducated and who may even be not too bright. You wouldn't grant her free legal aid. On the contrary, in, in that case, see, now, now you're dealing with a dereliction of duty on the part of, of a father. And in such a case, it is very clear that that father has responsibilities towards the children that he has brought into the world. And it is therefore appropriate under the criminal law 
to compel that father to recognize those responsibilities and live up to them. No, no, but you've jumped a little. There is a trial that precedes that. And that father might get away with it if he has a good lawyer and she does not. Well, you, you, you could raise the same argument regarding uh -huh. any legal situation. You know, some, some lawyers are, are more skilled perhaps than others or more knowledgeable and it may well occur that in some cases a person may be able to escape justice by having a, a good lawyer. And you would There's not no guarantee want against to, that. You would not want to redress this at all by affording a lawyer to the, uh, to the mother with the children who's been abandoned by the father and who can't afford a lawyer. I would not address it through that way. I would address it through the criminal law, the way the, the way criminals are, are prosecuted. I would, I would prosecute the father under the criminal law. But to prosecute the father, a case has to be made that this father, and he'll defend himself. Well, okay. But if you, what you're saying there is you will prosecute him, that is the use of public funds for a prosecutor. So where is your principle? The principle there is that as we protect the rights of individuals against the use of force, we also protect, in this case, children who are dependent upon a father who has brought them into the world for support until they're able to support themselves. Therefore, we would, we ought to act to prevent that father from failing to live up to an obligation that he has assumed of his own free will voluntarily. Sir, all I can do is quote Voltaire at you and say, though I abhor your opinions, I will defend to the death your right to hold them. <laughs> bon, après Voltaire, maintenant, qui? <laughs> Alors, Monsieur uh, Nystrom? <laughs> It seems to me you said somewhere along the line that all provinces should be equal, right? That's and correct. have equal rights and privileges, and, uh, and uh, I take it from there, the programs of each province should be equal as well, and there should be no special status or, or no uh, unique status from one province to the other. I see where, very well where your question is leading, and... I would answer by saying that each province should have equal powers, equal authority. That does not in any way compel them to use their authority to set up a particular program necessarily. I'd like to ask you about your own province of Ontario. Uh, in Ontario, the, the corporate income tax is collected by the by the provincial government. In Saskatchewan and Manitoba, BC, Alberta, the four Atlantic provinces, it's collected by the federal government. That is a special status for, for Ontario. Uh, in in, uh, in uh, Alberta, I should say, too, the corporate tax is collected by the province of Alberta. In Quebec, uh, both corporate and, in, and individual taxes are collected by the province of Quebec. So you have a special status being given to Alberta and Ontario and Quebec to collect corporate income tax. Uh, that is not the case in the other seven provinces, and then Quebec has a special status again in terms of collecting the individual income tax. Would this be a violation of what you would see as the, the fundamental uh, equality of the provinces? Only if it was entrenched in the Constitution. If, for example, the federal government enters into an agreement which is not entrenched into the Constitution, whereby Normally, the federal government might collect a particular type of tax, but in the one case, it would be collected by that province. If such agreement is strictly outside the constitutional framework and therefore is open to termination by either level of government, then I would not see that as a violation of the equality of the provinces. So long as each province has equal powers and equal status in the Constitution, that would, that it would be one of our objectives. 
What about the case of civil law, where in the province of Quebec there is a reality of a civil law code, common law in the other provinces, uh, that is really a, a unique status, applying only to one province? It certainly is unique. I'm not... It's a special status. I'm not certain like that it is necessarily a special status. However, the Constitution, where, where there is any conflict between in the case of Quebec, the Civil Code and the Constitution, very clearly the Constitution of Canada must take precedence and must override anything in the civil law that is contrary to the Constitution. I wanted to ask you a question similar to what Mr. Blackburn was asking uh, in terms of your amending formula idea where you have an amendment carried by, by two-thirds of the provinces or 75 percent of the people. And he made the case that uh, this could obviously uh, uh, exclude uh, the province of Quebec but if you had also an amendment that uh, was carried by two-thirds of the provinces, you could have some very important things in my province of Saskatchewan or Manitoba or Alberta that are unique to the prairies that might be overridden by the majority. Now, in a federal state, uh, how can you justify uh, the tyranny of the majority in this sense overriding the rights of the minority? To the extent that in our proposal we <coughs> proposed that any amendment be approved by three quarters of all adult Canadians and also a majority within each of three quarters of the provinces. That makes it very, very, in fact, very easy to defeat an amendment. You only need just over one quarter of the people in Canada either to stay home or to vote no. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask just What's two more quick questions, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm yeah. from Saskatchewan. Who is the Freedom Party of Ontario? Uh, what is your membership? Tell us a bit about your party. Uh, maybe I'm just a country boy from Saskatchewan, not aware of your, of your party here in the province of Ontario. I assume you're an officially registered party in Ontario. Yeah. You can tell us a little bit about your party so we have some background. And my final question was, uh, following up on Senator Giganis, where you're saying governments exist to protect the natural rights of individuals to life, liberty, and property, and not for any other purpose. Uh, there are lots of reasons that, prop, that governments exist to provide medical care, to provide education, uh, uh, affirmative action programs for women, uh, for Aboriginal peoples, uh, to build highways, to build schools. Uh, are, are those legitimate roles for government? Uh, if they are, how do they fit into your philosophy of, of, of liberty and property? And also tell us a bit about your party. By all means, as you have suggested the Freedom Party is a, an officially registered political party in the province of Ontario. At the present time, we are active only in the province of Ontario on a provincial basis. We have fielded candidates in the last three provincial elections. My position within the party is that I'm the Metro Regional Vice President. As you can t see from our presentation today, our philosophy is that government exists to protect individual rights and freedoms, not to restrict them. That's our platform, our philosophy of government. All of our positions on every issue that comes up are based consistently on that philosophy. They never waver. We never have to ask what we think, what we think may be popular to find out where we stand. Our positions are always based consistently on our philosophy. Regarding things like uh, health care, education, etc. These are things that can be acquired outside the realm of government. Protection of our rights, however, is something that you cannot acquire outside of government. Just you one do, quick question you require there, government then, for that. Just one quick question of me there then. Would you ideally then uh, eliminate or abolish uh, medical care, publicly funded medical care, hospitalization, um, the public school system? Would that be consistent with your philosophy to, to eliminate the country of those plans? Well, to answer your question, we, for 20, well over 20 years in this country, we have had a government monopoly health system. Prior to that time, we had competitive health, health care. When the, in the province of Ontario, when OHIP was established, it was made illegal for competing suppliers 
to offer the same, same types of coverage as OHIP. OHIP was also subsidized by the taxpayers from day one. Now, I, I strongly would suggest that at some point, I, hopefully if not with a relative in hospital, you should go visit a hospital and look at the empty wards, the empty beds, the things that have been closed because the government is failing to do that job. It's doing a, a terrible job. We have such a shortage in our hospitals that people who need urgent l surgery for life-threatening illnesses have to wait. And sometimes they can't afford to wait. They die while they're waiting. Likewise, we have a school system that in the province of Ontario, which I'm most familiar with, is spending today close to three times as much per student on education as it's of Ontario, which I'm most familiar with, is spending today close to three times as much per student on education as it did 10 years ago, and doing a worse job of educating children to face life in the real world than was done 10 years ago. At the same time, thousands of people, wherever they can, and some of them are making extreme sacrifices to do so, are taking their children out of that government-run school system and placing them in alternative schools because they think their children are better off there. So to suggest, as has been implied by your questions, that the country will fall apart if we don't have compulsory government-supported schools or Medicare, I think is fallacious. I thank, um, um, is it Mr. Frampton, is that your name? That's correct. Yeah. The, this has given us an opportunity to really um, look at some of the prevailing values in, in Canada. And um, what your whole presentation is based upon is a, a political philosophy uh, that the individual is, is primary. And I think it fails to recognize that um, the individual is also part of a community, and that's where our political philosophies all diverge, because I think that um, we as human beings could not, I mean, it's all based on the nature of human beings, and political theory is, is uh, it's rife with all sorts of varying interpretations of what, of what human beings are, and, and therefore, what theories of governance should um, should predominate for, for what's most appropriate for we as human beings. We would die if it weren't for one another. And so I think our, our, we have uh, incumbent upon us as politicians uh, a mechanism for organizing uh, that relationship. That's what politics is, is organizing the relationship amongst us. And our constitution, I think, should reflect that. We're very different from the United States because we recognize that there is that we are a community. We're very different in the kind of um, historical development of our country, where the um, I don't see that the community interests necessarily have to um, preclude respect for individual rights, but when it all comes down to, down to it. The role of government, the role of government is to make, make certain that we can live together harmoniously as a community. And certainly, I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm not advocating that the government gets in and, and uh, infringes on uh, individual human rights. I would be uh, the first to defend uh, all of that. But the role of government is, is to organize us politically so that that we can live harmoniously. And, now, and our Constitution should reflect that. We've got, um, I mean, do you believe, I mean, you're talking about taking away things. Um, I think you, uh, in, in answer to um, Senator Gigantis' point, you said it would be theft. Do you, do you believe that the taxation system is theft? You've raised two questions. I'd like to answer both of them. 
with regards to the first one regarding communities, we certainly do recognize that it is desirable, indeed necessary, for human beings to live in harmonious communities. In fact, that's why I'm here today, because such harmonious communities can only be based upon respect for individual rights. Whenever you get into a situation where individual rights are not respected or are violated, you have disharmony. You have conflict, as in, for example, in the province of Quebec, the conflict between the majority in that province who desire to have laws to protect the French language from what they see as a threat, and the minority in that province who wants to enjoy their rights to, if they so choose, use a different language. You have disharmony in the province of Ontario between those who want all the stores to be closed on Sunday and those of different persuasions, whether they be a different religious persuasion or some other viewpoint who believe that that law is discriminatory against them and who see that it has severe personal consequences for them. And that certainly is the case with those who have a different religion and who are devout in that religion. With regard to your second question, which uh, unfortunately has slipped my mind. What was the second question the regarding? Taxation. Taxation system. Any tax, and I, I, as I have argued in the editorial pages of the newspapers, any tax for anything other than essential services that are provided to every taxpayer is unjust. You have the, the purpose of the, the majority of the taxes we are paying in this country today, and they are high taxes, believe me, is to take people's mon hard-earned money away from them and give it to someone else. What right do we have to do that? What's fair about that? There is no fairness in that. That's unfair. It's unjust. It's wrong. Thank you. I, I, I echo Senator Giganti's uh, uh, quotation. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Hunter. Uh, Mr. Uh, Frampton, you have exposed uh, very clearly the uh, philosophy of your uh, uh, party and, uh, of course, uh, the debate on the values and the debate on individual and collective rights is, uh, is a debate that is going to go on for, uh, for a long time. And it is, of course, very, very difficult to draw a line between uh, individual and uh, collective rights. But as you have seen from our discussion, uh, people agree to, to disagree sometime, and uh, I wish to thank you for your presentation. I wish to thank all of you also for this opportunity. It's been a pleasure. Yep.